Okay, welcome back, folks. Um, we uh, hopefully you had a chance to watch the videos this weekend. Uh, I apologize, I forgot to post for you the uh, video for Saturday. And so um, uh, hopefully you were able to watch both videos yesterday and uh, get caught up with this whole idea behind what molecular orbitals are. Um, <clears throat> if you have to, I, I would suggest that you watch those two videos before you watch this one. Uh, if you pick up um, this video without watching the other two, it's going to be real difficult for you, uh, even with the little review that I give you right now, to kind of um, understand what, what we've done so far or how we go about analyzing and assessing uh, these uh, different um, uh, diatomic molecules that we've used so far to discuss what, um, uh, what um, molecular orbitals are. Okay. So please make sure you watch those videos, and um, and if you uh, like I said, if you have any questions, please make sure you come by, and then you get your questions answered for sorry about that, uh, for uh, for uh, about molecular orbitals. Okay, so um, please come by and see me, folks. I haven't seen anyone since uh, we got back from Easter break, so please make sure uh, you take advantage of the office hours and come by and get your questions answered. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and let's dive into this discussion of molecular orbitals okay, and, uh, and what they are. Okay. So keep this in mind. There are two basic theories for how atoms come together to form these covalent bonds. We are focusing on covalent bonds. The discussion in chapter eight, the discussion in chapter nine have, have been strictly about covalent, uh, covalent bonds. We, we've already discussed ionic bonds. We left that discussion with lattice energies and we talked about that already. The focus of the last couple chapters have been on covalent bonds and how we explain the formation of covalent bonds. So the covalent bonds form, remember, when electrons are shared between atoms. And so two theories, there are two basic theories that we, we have right now that try to explain how those electrons are shared between the atoms. We talked about the uh, localized electron model. Localized electron model, remember, allowed us to predict shapes, the geometries, it allowed us to discuss hybridizations. And so it does a very good job of using um, these hybridized orbitals and explaining the geometry, the shapes of these molecules. And, and so the uh, central tenet, the primary uh, uh, emphasis of the localized electron model is that the electrons are being shared between two atoms within that molecule so that the bonds then will form. Okay? And so the electrons then stay localized between the two atoms and so because of that, they don't move throughout the atom. Okay? And so with that said, then there's a second. The, the, the problem with the localized electron model is that it doesn't do a very good job of explaining why these bonds form. It, it tells us what they do, what these electrons do uh, when they, when they are, are shared between the atoms, but it doesn't really give us a reason why these, uh, these atoms would want to get together in the first place. So in steps the molecular orbital uh, theory. The molecular orbital model helps us to explain how these molecules form, why these molecules would form in the first place. Why would these atoms want to share their electrons? And the primary reason why atoms would share electrons in order to form a bond is that they then achieve a lower energy state when they do so. If they don't achieve a lower energy state, nothing would happen. Okay? And so the molecular orbital theory allows us to do that. And what the molecular orbital theory also allows us to do is it'll also allows us to um, use what we know about quantum physics, quantum mecha the quantum mechanical model of the atom, and apply that to the molecule now. And so we have orbitals, we have orbitals, but this time we have molecular orbitals, and, we, and we'll talk real quickly about how they form in just a moment. And the way these orbitals feel is uh, exactly the same way atomic orbitals feel. And so these molecular orbitals form when these atoms get closer and closer together, and these atoms then take their orbitals, take their atomic orbitals, and blend them together, combine them together to form these new molecular orbitals. These molecular orbitals run throughout the molecule itself. It's not limited to just the, uh, just the area, the region between the two atoms, but it, is, it, it runs throughout the whole molecule. It is a brand new set of orbitals that only occur when these atoms form a molecule. So you gotta make sure you keep that in mind that molecular orbitals are found when atoms come together to form molecules. Atomic orbitals exist when the atoms are all by themselves and they are, no long, they are not with other atoms. 
But as soon as they get with the other atoms, they will form these molecular orbitals. And that, at least, is what the molecular orbital theory postulates. Okay? All right, so with that said then, when two atoms get together, they will form a, a set of molecular orbitals. And we've talked about so far the sigma and the sigma star. One is going to be conducive to bonding, the other conducive to, to anti-bonding, non-bonding. Okay? Uh, the term non-bonding, not quite as good, uh, but the idea right now is that when you ev whenever you have electrons that are sitting in this higher energy anti-bonding orbital, that is not, that, that's a situation, that's a condition not conducive of bonding, okay, because you have an electron in a higher energy state, and remember, atoms don't want to be in a higher energy state, they don't want their electrons to be in a higher energy state when they get together, they want to be able to lower the energies of their uh, electrons, okay. All right, and so you, but you do have two, two orbitals forming. The reason for that is because you have this conservation. If you're going to take two atomic orbitals and combine them together, you should end up with two orbitals that are molecular in nature, but they should still be two. Okay, so what, that's what we have here. And so that's what happens. And we were able to take a, we were able to use the molecular orbital theory to explain how the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen molecule forms, the H2 molecule forms when the two electrons from the 1s orbitals from each hydrogen atom, they come together, they merge, they form these. Uh, the sigma bonding and the sigma antibody molecular orbitals. And so when they fall into the lower energy state, we have then a situation that is conducive to bonding. If you have electrons in a high energy state, not conducive to bonding. And so with that understanding, then we can go ahead and analyze other molecules. For example, the uh, molecule that, I, that we uh, finished analyzing before we finished up uh, yesterday was we analyzed this anion of the hydrogen molecule. And the question then, can this particular ion exist? And we saw then that the answer was no for one simple reason right now, and that is you have an electron when the hydrogen molecule gets together with a hydrogen, um, an hydrogen atom here, okay? You get this hydrogen molecule because you have uh, this, this anion here, because you have then, remember, um, two protons, but three electrons, you have to count for so there's three electrons here, but two protons, that's where this negative sign comes from. And so therefore, the third electron must, there is no room for that third electron to fall in here, remember, just like with atomic orbitals, there's only two electrons that can fill in a single um, uh, uh, molecular orbital. And so the two electrons, when they get together, the, uh, the, this electron will fill in here, this electron will fill in here. And so there, uh, this particular um, molecular orbital gets filled. The last electron has to uh, move up to the antibonding molecular orbital here. That is not a conducive state because you have one electron that is higher in energy than the, atom, the electrons were initially. So this right here, this is here what um, allows us to, to conclude then that this molecule cannot exist. That molecule can't exist because you have an electron in a higher energy state. Okay. All right, then what we were able to do is we were able to talk about bond orders. I introduced to you this concept of bond orders and what the bond order allows us to do, and it's a calculation that we can do, it allows us to calculate then for the strength of the bond and essentially that's what we, uh, we were able to do with that. So the higher the bond order, the bigger that number, the stronger that bond is going to be. And we saw then by you calculating for the bond order, which is taking then the number of electrons in the, bo uh, in the bonding state and subtracting from that the number of electrons in the anti-bonding state and dividing it by two, we get then the bond order. So the larger the bond order, the stronger the bond is going to be between the stronger the covalent bond is going to be between the two atoms. Okay, and so we're able to compare then um, the, here we saw then the bond order is one half, comparing that to the bond order for um, the hydrogen ion, uh, the hydrogen molecule itself, which had a bond order of one. This bond then was, is about two times greater than the bond that would hold if it, if this molecule did form, would hold those two atoms together. Okay, all right. So that's where we left off with, and that's where we left off with, and that's what you got to make sure you're able to do as you move forward. Okay, so. What I wanted to do then is I left you with this particular problem here. I asked you then to, um, there we go. Okay. I asked you to write out the, and I didn't make this an assignment here, but I asked you to uh, write out the, um, to describe the uh, bonding situation for this molecule here. So we're asking, I'm asking you to uh, uh, assess this helium, diatomic helium. Okay. So, can diatomic helium exist? Does the two helium atoms bond together covalently to form this diatomic molecule? Okay, so the question then is we're asking you this. Okay? Uh, helium here, so you have your two helium um, helium here. So there's a helium atom with its two electrons. Okay, 
and the two electrons, so this is helium, we'll call this helium uh, A, okay, with its two electrons in the 1s orbital. So you have a 1s orbital, uh, 1s orbital with the two electrons, unlike the hydrogen with just one electron, so that's going to move in. Okay. Then you have your second helium, oh, sorry, you have your second helium atom here, your second helium atom here, okay, with its two electrons in the 1s orbital, okay, and we'll call this helium B, and they start approaching each other, okay, and when they start approaching each other, what we see that's going to happen then is, and let's, uh, let's make sure we, we, we get this, uh, uh, we understand this, that the two atoms here will share their electrons. The two atoms here will share their electrons, and so let's go, and then they will form then, so the two s orbitals here will form then a sigma uh, uh, bonding and a sigma and one sigma antibody. So you will have two molecular orbitals in which to fill in these four electrons. So we have a count of four electrons. So uh, if this molecule forms, if this molecule is formed in, uh, when the molecule is formed, we have to position four electrons in order to see what, um, uh, where they will be. And based on that, we can um, uh, determine then whether a, uh, this particular molecule will form or not. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead then. And let me go ahead and uh, clear that out. And let's take a look at the energy diagram. Okay. All right, so there are the two helium atoms. Okay. And so there are the two molecular orbitals that form. There is your bonding. So remember, this, uh, this represents the bonding molecular orbital that forms for, and this right here, folks, this would be the helium-2. This represents the helium-2 um, um, uh, electron position, and the electron configuration for helium-2 then is going to be sigma uh, 1s2, okay. and sigma 1s uh, star 2. Okay, so that's what we have then for the um, electron configuration for this helium molecule. Okay, so um, let's go ahead then real quick. Uh, let's calculate for the bond order and let's see then uh, what the bond order is. So I would like you to take, um, um, let's go ahead and calculate for the bond order here. Okay, and let's determine what it has. So the bond order is gonna be equal to two. Uh, so it's gonna be the, uh, electro the bonding electrons, which is gonna be two minus the antibody electrons, which will be two in this case, divided by two, so we have a bond order of zero in this case then. Okay, so we have a bond order of zero, okay, and uh, we have two electrons in the antibody state here. This bonding, remember, the larger the bonding order, the larger the bond order, the stronger the bond's gonna be. And so here we have a bond order of zero, which means then um, that's not favorable. I'm sorry, so that's not favorable for the formation of helium here. And two electrons here in the antibody state, that's not favorable for helium, this helium molecule either. And so diatomic helium does not exist. And that makes sense for what we know about noble gases. Noble gases tend to exist in the monatomic state rather than the diatomic state. So uh, this confirms for us then that the helium, diatomic helium, cannot and will not exist for two reasons. For two reasons, and we have the confirmation here. Reason number one, uh, we have, okay, reason number one, we have two electrons in the antibonding, which is not a very good situation. And reason number two, the bond order then is a very low, a small bond order. We have a bond order of zero, and so you can't get any smaller than that. Okay. All right, very good. Let's go ahead then, and let's uh, continue on. So hopefully you had drawn that, okay? Hope you're able to draw, uh, draw these two molecular orbitals here and uh, get that done. Okay. Let's go ahead then and let me, okay. Okay. so what we're going to do moving forward then, so what we saw then with uh, the two, the three molecules, three molecules that we've talked about so far, the three molecules that we've talked about so far, so we've talked about uh, this molecule, which may not exist, this molecule, which does not exist, and this molecule here, which does not exist, but what, what we have done is we've analyzed what are called homonuclear diatomic molecules. First of all, let's go ahead and, and analyze what the term here means. Diatomic meaning then two, two atoms. And so these are molecules made up of two atoms. The term homonuclear, the term homonuclear here then represents then same uh, 
um, nucleus. Okay, so what we're dealing here then is we are dealing with two identical atoms. Okay, so homonuclear means then uh, same nucleus, meaning same protons, same number of protons, same number of neutrons. In this case, then we're not worried about that so much, but same number of protons, which means then we're dealing with identical atoms. Okay, so that's what the term homonuclear means. Okay. And so what we're, what we're going to do moving forward is we're going to continue talking about these homonuclear uh, molecules, okay, homonuclear uh, diatomic molecules, because we want to keep it simple. We can apply molecular orbital theory to more complex uh, molecules, but what we want to do is focus on just the simplest molecules first, understand how uh, the molecular orbital theory works, and then uh, uh, later on in higher level classes, we can go ahead and apply molecular orbital theory uh, to understand then how larger molecules will interact with one another. Okay? But essentially what you're gonna make sure you understand then is that we will be dealing only with valence electrons, folks. Remember the core electrons do not involve themselves in bonding. And we learned that back in first year chemistry. And so the covalent bonds that form only deal with the um, uh, valence electrons for one very simple and obvious reason. And that is they are furthest away from the nucleus. They are furthest away from the nucleus and most likely to interact. And so if you have these core electrons here, we call those the core electrons, okay? But those core electrons, they are sitting very close to the nucleus. They don't do any interaction. They, they are bound tightly to the nucleus. But then you have these electrons out here that are further away from the nucleus. And these are our valence electrons, the electrons furthest away from the nucleus. These will be the ones that will be responsible for interacting with other electrons from other atoms. And so make sure you understand then that as we move forward and we start talking about larger homonuclear diatomic molecules, okay, uh, uh, molecules that are comprised of atoms that have more than just two or four electrons, okay, we will be focusing in on only the interactions between the valence electrons, the ones that are furthest away from the nucleus. And so you want to make sure you keep that in mind as we move forward with this. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and ask you to do something. Else. Let me ask you to do something. Let's go ahead then, and I want us to analyze this here. So I want you to take a couple of moments here uh, to take a look at this molecule. So we are going to analyze together this diatomic lithium. The question then is, does diatomic lithium exist? Can it exist based on two criteria, bond order, and whether it has electrons in that anti-bonding um, energy, uh, anti-bonding molecular orbit. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is take a couple minutes to show me then how diatomic lithium, how those electrons will be shared in uh, with uh, diatomic lithium. Okay, so take a couple minutes to get uh, that answer. Okay, go ahead and get that done. Okay, let's go ahead then and. Um, Sorry, let's go ahead then and let's take a look at diatomic lithium here. Okay, let's take a look at diatomic lithium and um, let's see what we have. So uh, lithium then, remember, is, uh, let, let's go ahead and draw this out really quickly. Lithium has uh, a lithium atom, single lithium atom, has an electron configuration 1s2, 2s1. Okay. Remember, these are the core electrons. We don't worry about the interactions of these. These don't uh, actually interact with it at all. So we are just focusing on this one electron right here. We only worry about that one electron. So essentially then lithium, if you want to think about it, is an atom okay, in which you have one electron, one valence electron, and we're only going to look at the 2s electron. We're only going to look at the 2s electron. So let's take a look at this lithium atom here. We'll call this lithium A. And then let's take a look at this lithium atom here, which we will call lithium B, and it has an electron in the 2s orbital. And so let me pause right there and make sure everyone understands then that we are not concerned. We, when we talk about the bonding situation here, uh, we are not concerned with these two electrons. We only look at this one electron here, and that's why I only draw these two. We only want the one electron here from this lithium, lithium A, and this one electron here from lithium B, and that's why I've also indicated then that we are focusing in on only the 2s orbital. Okay, that's your valence, uh, valence orbital. All right, so these are going to come together. These are going to gap the uh, um, uh, bridge the distance between the, the, uh, the two atoms there, and as they get closer and closer together, since we're dealing with s orbitals here, and, and mind you, We've been talking about the blending together of 1s orbitals. So in hydrogen, we were talking about the blending together of 1s orbitals. 
Why? Because the one electron in hydrogen resides in the 1s orbital. Here, the electron that will be responsible for the bonding resides in the 2s orbital, but that doesn't change anything. That doesn't change anything. So you will form then, if you're going to blend together, merge together two s orbitals in the second energy level, you would expect to form then a sigma bonding interaction, uh, a sigma bonding, a sigma, uh, sigma molecular orbital. This time though, this is going to be sigma 2s. Okay. And then you should also be forming a sigma star, a sigma antibody molecular orbital, and this will be a 2s rather than a 1s. Okay. And so these two should form. These two should form. And so let's take a look at the energetics, uh, how, uh, the energetics of these two and see how they, uh, they fit into the, uh, the, the structure of the, um, of the molecule. Okay, so let's go ahead then and let's take a look at this before I uh, finish up here. Okay. And so there we have it. Okay. And so when these two, two S orbitals get together, and there's the lithium. And again, lithium does not only, and let me make sure this is, everyone's clear on this because I've had people um, uh, ask me about this and, and ask me, well, why is lithium, why does lithium only have one electron? Lithium does not have only one electron. Lithium has three electrons, but we're only focusing on, focusing in on the one valence electron from lithium and that resides in the 2s orbital. Okay? So you have the valence electron here. Okay? You have the valence electron here. They get together. They form the sigma. Uh, so this is your bonding. Here's your bonding molecular orbital. And here's your antibonding. So just like with uh, hydrogen, uh, it will form a bonding and an antibonding molecular orbital. However, the key difference between diatomic lithium here and uh, diatomic hydrogen the key difference is that the sigma and the sigma stars, so this uh, bonding and the uh, antibody molecular orbitals form from the 2s, not from the 1s, but the 2s orbitals, but the uh, configuration will still be the same, where you have the sigma bonding is going to be lower than the sigma antibody. And so what do these two electrons want to do? They will get together and they will form them. Um, they, they will get together and they will sit in the lower energy molecular orbital. And so far, and so thus, based on this alone, based on this alone, we would expect that molecule to form. We would expect them because you have two electrons in the lower, in the lower uh, sigma, uh, um, uh, lower bonding molecular orbital. This represents a pro-bonding state, remember. So this is pro-bonding meaning then that this is conducive of bonding, where you have two electrons in the uh, sigma uh, bonding molecular orbital. And so diatomic lithium must exist. However, however, let's go ahead then and let's calculate then for the, um, for the bond order here. Let's calculate for the bond order. Okay? And let's see what we have. Here, okay? okay, let's calculate for the bond order. Okay? And let's see what we have. Okay? Bond order then is going to be um, two. Okay, so we have two bonding electrons, zero non-bonding electrons divided by two, and so the bond order is one. And so, folks, hydrogen had a pro-bonding situation where it has two electrons in the sigma uh, in the bonding molecular orbital, and it also had a bond order of one. So we would expect then the diatomic lithium okay, should be a stable molecule, and we should be able to find it. We should be able to find it in in nature. Okay. And so based on molecular orbital theory and the two parts that we've, learned, uh, we've talked about so far, this molecule should exist. This is a stable molecule. So this should be a stable molecule based on our analysis here. Okay. This is a stable molecule based on our analysis here. And so diatomic lithium should be out there in the same way that we know that diatomic hydrogen exists in nature. Diatomic hydrogen is, exists in nature. We know that for a fact. Diatomic lithium does not exist in nature. It doesn't. Remember, lithium is a metal. And so what I would like to do then is I want to, um, so diatomic lithium, even though we predict that it should exist based on a molecular orbital theory, diatomic doesn't exist. Diatomic lithium does not exist because lithium is a metal. And remember with metals, instead of grouping together in, in, in small uh, groups like this, lit, uh, metals then remember, they exist as a large conglomerate of atoms that come together and they share their electrons okay in what we refer to as that c of electron model c of electron model okay 
in which the electrons are delocalized as well. Okay. But it's delocalized across all of the atoms that make up the particular lithium metal. Okay. So lithium does not exist as a diatomic molecule. It exists then as a conglomerate, a grouping of billions upon billions upon billions of lithium atoms that come together and they share their valence electrons here with all the other lithium, not just with one other lithium. Okay. All right, so this goes to show us then that the molecular orbital theory does a pretty good job of predicting um, what, what molecules should form, but we also have to take into consideration other factors that we know about these um, uh, elements themselves. Okay, so for example, again, lithium is a metal. Lithium does not exist as a diatomic molecule. It exists as a, um, in this metallic bond. So we know then lithium doesn't participate in covalent bonding. Lithium participates in metallic bonding. So, um, so even though, and th this is the, the deficiency, metallic bonding, uh, molecular orbital theory, and that is, it does a pretty good job of, uh, of explaining how non-metals get together to form um, compounds, but not so, good, not so much with metal atoms. Okay? All right, so with that said then, we will pick up with this, and what I would like you to do for, to, uh, for, the, for the, this period, for the remainder here, is that uh, we've done um, a handful of molecules. We, we, we've analyzed uh, hydrogen. We've analyzed hydrogen molecule, uh, hydrogen ion. We've analyzed helium, uh, the diatomic helium. Uh, we've analyzed diatomic lithium here. What I would like you to do, just to quickly finish up here, uh, on your paper, what I would like you to do then is I would like you to analyze diatomic beryllium. Now, again, beryllium is going to be a metal, and we know that beryllium um, it would exist as a metal, okay, in the sea of electrons, okay. So what I would like you to do then is let's let's assume that diatomic beryllium uh, does exist based on the molecular orbital theory. Question then is does and let me go ahead and address this. Here. Does um, diatomic beryllium exist according to the MO theory to molecular orbital theory. Okay. Answer that question. Okay. Answer that question. We'll pick up with this tomorrow. Okay. Uh, answer that question and then show me uh, either it does or it does not. Show me why. Okay. So give me a reason why. Okay. So please, on your paper, write this down. Okay. Answer, uh, uh, answer this question and then we'll go over it tomorrow. Okay. All right. Very good, folks. I will see you tomorrow.